Hello, History 72A, Winter Quarter 2024. I don't know how people open musical concerts now, big ones, not like dive bar ones. But they used to say things like, hello, Detroit, or hello, Chicago. So I always feel a little bit like that when I start out. Hello, 72A. This is our last lecture in Module B. For this particular lecture, we will be focusing on the English colonizers of the 1600s and their anxieties, and they had lots of them, when they arrived on the eastern seaboard of North America. English colonization would end up having an outsized influence on the future of North America, including in the development of hegemonic, meaning most powerful here for us, ideas of law, politics, society, and sex gender in what is now the United States. As ever, with the quiz answers, I am impressed by the depth of your thought and insight. You really are a great group. There is, however, one part of the quote that I would like to focus on a bit more, and that is the each of which were diverse and divisive bit. Quite reasonably, especially given the long-term impact of European colonialism, many of you are still thinking in terms of big picture divisions. In the big picture, not just over space, but over time, there is definitely a macro layer of Europeans versus Native Americans that we will see now built into American law and culture. But it matters that it was the Spanish who claimed much of South America, along with Central America and a fair chunk of North America. It matters that England and France made conflicting claims in North America east of the Mississippi River. It matters a lot that those three European countries, Spain, France, and England, were busily killing one another in Europe and dragging other European countries into the fight. Just as we do not want to homogenize Native Americans by only staying at the European meets Native American layer, we also don't want to get stuck on the layer Europeans as an undifferentiated group meet diverse Native American groups. Native Americans and Europeans could not see the future. None of them formed mass alliances in which all European nations faced a large unified group of Native Americans or vice versa. In the 1600s, there wasn't even a unified group of Athapascans and Iroquois versus English and French. And just as a refresher, Athapascans and Iroquois and English and French, we talked about in the last lecture, all contesting the space here when the first English and French came over. That sort of alignment, Athapascans and Iroquois versus English and French, that sort of alignment would come a couple of centuries later, but not until near the end of the time period covered by the course. The conflicts between European nations taking place in the time period we are looking at now, the 1600s, would spread from Europe to European colonies, including those in Asia and the Pacific and those in the Americas by the 1700s. The Seven Years' War was perhaps the first global or world war. We probably will not talk about it much in here, but the Seven Years' War, which immediately preceded the American Revolution, is considered by many American historians to be the First World War. The French and English fought one another in Europe, dragging everyone else in Europe pretty much, and they fought over colonial possessions. The fighting in North America was particularly intense and pitted not just European interests against one another, but pushed Native Americans into situations in which different groups allied themselves with either France or England, and that meant against one another. 
The part of the Seven Years' War that was fought in North America is often called the French and Indian War, which is rather misleading as it sounds like the French were either fighting all Indians or perhaps the French were allied with all Indians in fighting Great Britain, when in reality, the British and some Native American groups were fighting the French and other Native American groups, which means that not only were Europeans fighting one another, different groups of Native Americans were fighting one another. The Seven Years' War did not officially start until 1756, but the situations and decisions leading to it started in the period that we are looking at with this series of lectures. This includes the events that resulted in the breakdown of alliances shown in the chart on the right. Those groups you saw in the last lecture, Athapaskan and Iroquois speaking groups of Native Americans, had already periodically fought with one another over regions of land use. But as I noted in the two preceding lectures, this was guided by rules of warfare and not all-out bloody global or even continental war. The growing presence of European colonists put increasing pressure on land and increasing tension between Native Americans. In the regions we are looking at in this lecture and the last, the Athapascans in particular ended up divided internally. In some cases, alignment of a Native American group with the British or French represented pragmatic economic decisions in the changed and increasingly colonized context of North America. But Native American groups also used alliances with the British or French to settle old scores of their own. In the time period of Module B, including the rest of this lecture, Native American groups did not foresee themselves evicted wholesale from their homelands. Native Americans had not, for thousands of years, considered themselves part of a single people, all linked by their presence on what would later be called American continents. The initial English incursions into the northeast of North America involved small numbers of people who were seen by Native Americans as a nuisance and or a localized danger, but not as an existential threat. By Module D and the mid-18th century, the handwriting was on the wall, as it became clear that Europeans, and for today's lecture, particularly the English, planned to stay. Native American groups in northeastern North America adjusted to or incorporated, whether they wanted to or not, English ideas of borders and land ownership. Well before the Seven Years' War, as it became increasingly obvious that Europeans would keep arriving, Native American groups used the presence of European colonists to form alliances that would allow their own specific group to maintain as much land as possible, even if part or all of that land had been occupied by another Native American group for centuries. By the time of the Seven Years' War, alliances in northeastern North America looked like the chart on the previous slide. What I'm trying to show on this slide is a dispersal of Native American groups, not because they were randomly around, but because they worked out land ownership and politics differently to the way that Europeans were doing. Europeans were dividing everything up into cohesive nation states. The colonists push newly concentrated populations together and push those groups into another squished together group causing conflict. Going back to our quote from Gutierrez, sometimes many of the voices in the larger groups spoke in unison, meaning they allied with groups from their own continent, the more obvious of the big picture patterns. And other times they were diverse and divided among themselves, meaning that groups on or originated from the same continent fighting against one another. The divisive state is the more difficult condition 
to imagine as factoring into the big picture levels given later history. But those sorts of disputes are often quite relevant to the history we are looking at in this class. In this lecture, we are looking at the English who were incredibly quarrelsome and divisive at pretty much all levels. The English argued with other Europeans and they argued with other people in England. English colonists argued with Native Americans, with French colonists, with people in English colonies other than their own, and with their immediate neighbors in the same town. With that in mind, we will leave the Seven Years' War and go back to the 17th century, the 1600s, and for Europeans, what may now be referred to as the early modern period. These images of English people being grumpy and dissatisfied with everyone around them are all from the 1600s. I will not go through them, but I do recommend the site, Public Domain Review, as a fun place to occupy or waste time, depending on your perspective, or to not waste time, but to find ideas for your primary sources for your big project. The argumentative English colonists were also remarkably anxious, not just about matters of survival, but about being mistaken for or becoming like any of the groups they argued with. The English wanted land in North America, but they also thought that the climate and surroundings might make them degenerate into a more savage state of being, which is why this lecture is called Early Encounters 3, Eastern Seaboard of North America, and then The Unstable Early Modern Body and Anxious English Colonists. Early modern Europeans had a different construction of the body than we do now. Europeans had, of course, noticed that bodies change from babies to adults, from vigorous to frail, from alive to dead. Some changes were not so permanent. There were bodies that could become pregnant and then change again once the baby was expelled. Bodies could brown with exposure to the sun and fade again when hidden from the sun by clothing or the roof of a building. Bodies could change with many types of illness and those bodies might become healthy again. They might become scarred or again, they might become dead. If bodies could and did change in all of these ways and more, then bodies were inherently unstable things, unlike the soul, which lasted forever. But these bodies in the English mindset had to be sorted and given appropriate roles from birth. And the English sorted bodies first and foremost by sex and by hereditary class. This is one of those places where understanding context is critical to make sense of some of what people did and why. Put yourself in a world with no light or heat except for wood fires and candles and of course sunlight, no lights from passing cars or nearby towns, a world without the constant base level of sound that we don't even notice in our lives, traffic, electronic devices, the constant hum of people. This world had none of that. Anything that you had, thread, cloth, metal plowshares, wooden axe handles, shoes, you either had to make yourself or get from someone else who made it by hand. The spiritual world and the physical world overlapped. That wasn't a belief so much as a fact of daily life for these people. People died, infants died, children died, parents died, and not out of sight in a hospital or a hospice, but right there in the bed that you shared with them. Death from queer pearl fever, basically infection after childbirth, could take days, sometimes weeks. The same could be true of death from accidents and physical trauma. You might watch a loved one die in pain while you cared for them for months. Death was not hidden at all. It, like the spiritual world, was a tangible part of life. 
I say this because without some effort to imagine a completely different world to our own, some of the things that people did may seem ridiculous. These people were no more silly or stupid than we are, but they did live in an entirely different historical context. We are starting off here with the physical and social aspects of sex and the body in that unfamiliar reality. The image on the slide here is a family portrait. The boy and girl on the left are the children of the man and his first wife, the woman in the bed. By the time this painting was made, the first wife was dead, which is why her head and jaws are bound for burial. But she gestures toward her own children. The woman in the chair is the man's second wife, still alive at the time of the painting, and their first son. You can see the importance of sorting people and having them clearly marked by their clothing and by the work that they did in the Kathleen Brown article for this module. That article is one of the few that I actually ask you to read for a quiz question, but you need to watch the lecture as well. Whether a body were identified as male or female combined with hereditary class determined clothing, as you have seen, and appropriate labor. Again, you see this in the debate over Hall. Those intersecting categories, sex and hereditary class, also determined inheritance, name, place of residence, pretty much everything. For the English, the assignment of people to a particular combination of hereditary class and sex, with sex split into either male or female, that combination determined an individual's station in life and, critically, their relationship to land. If you were male and an aristocrat as opposed to a peasant, you might own land and be independent. We will explore the English connection between land and independence in the next module. For now, I want to consider the tension between having extremely defined and unchanging places in the social order, but also possessing unstable, changeable bodies. What would happen to the social order if bodies could morph into the wrong sex or class? Laws on occupation, clothing, ability to travel, and where to live could keep bodies sorted by class, especially if people lived in the same small region generation after generation, which they usually did. Everyone around you knew who you were, as well as who your parents were and their parents and their parents before. You married exclusively within your class, and you could not exactly fool people into thinking that you were a different class when everyone around you knew pretty much everything about you. But what? What if those unstable, changeable bodies could actually change sex? For the English in the early modern period, this was a real concern. You are looking here at a report on a cat born to a woman in Leicestershire in 1569. The report exists because the birth of a monster, and cats are monsters, the birth of a monster could have political and religious implications in a time when England was ruled by a woman, Elizabeth I, and had been pulled back and forth between Catholicism and Reformed churches, especially Anglicanism. The birth of a monster could be due to local witchcraft, but it could also be an omen, a sign that England was going in the wrong direction, according to God. This is not because early modern English people were stupid any more than any other group of people now or in the past. The early modern period is called modern because the roots of the disciplines that we use now to understand and organize the world, like physics, anatomy, and medicine, began to develop into forms we would recognize in the 1600s. The Renaissance, prior to the early modern period, had included astronomy carried over from the Middle Ages, but with new tools, think Galileo and telescopes. 
the early modern period saw the Western roots of that kind of urge to sort and explain the world in ways that were not only theological. You are looking at, if you are watching and not just listening, two early modern scholars. Most of you are likely familiar with Isaac Newton on the right here. You may not recognize his picture, but his name will be familiar, and many of you may think immediately of falling apples and gravity. Isaac Newton is reasonably well known in the history of physics and is credited with formulating laws of motion as well as universal gravitation. Relatively few anatomists and pretty much no phlebotomists, those are the people who take your blood, no William Harvey here on the left, but he provided the first mainly correct and complete description of the human circulatory system. Harvey served as a battlefield physician during the English Civil War, not the American, but the English Civil War. Supposedly, he worked out the circulatory action and system for blood by examining casualties on the battlefield, but that may be as apocryphal as Newton's apple. I generally try to avoid having many pictures of famous white men, but these two portraits are quite useful to us in this class. You know from the Brown reading that clothing was an essential way of marking sex gender on bodies in the early modern period. You know that this idea of clothing as a critical indicator of sex gender remained in Western society right up into the 21st century from the Dockers Wear the Pants advertising campaign, if nothing else. Many historians, and pretty much all people at their own time, would know immediately that these were men and that they were well-educated men, but not aristocrats. In that sense, these two portraits present pretty much the same things about Harvey and Newton. But the ways of signaling the correct degree and type of privilege possessed by the sitter have become quite different over just the course of around 60 years, six zero years. This is a good example of the idea of sex difference mattering and of the male-female binary being important in day-to-day -day life, but also the fluidity of the social indicators of male. On the left here, for the early 1600s, you can see that he's wearing a lace collar and it's starch so that it will hold that shape. Over here, by the time of Isaac Newton, he's wearing a shirt that's actually unfastened at the neck to give the ideal of comfort and casualness. We have a beard and facial hair, but in this case, long hair that's either pulled back or I think in this case cut. Here we have Sir Isaac Newton with his very beautiful hair down, and later that would be exaggerated by wearing a wig, and then men actually would crop their hair quite short, but they would always be seen with wigs if they were aristocrats or upper middle class. This is all about rigidity. There's reinforcement on the doublet here made by layers of cloth and sometimes cardboard. And there's an emphasis of softness here. And yet, in terms of sex and class, these two images mean the same thing. Paintings illustrate the need to differentiate who was a man by clothing, particularly as it was cold in England in the 17th century, and a body completely encased in heavy clothing would, a fair percentage of the time, not be immediately identifiable as male or female unless it was marked on the clothing. The insistence on a sex-gender binary is continuous. But the characteristics that marked someone as a man, in other words, not a woman, and the clothing used to signify maleness changed radically over time. This is really easy to see in clothing and hair, but part of the reason these change is that the ideal of the physical characteristics that signified male changed. This that you see on the slide here is not about whose body is more muscular and therefore strong in male, 
and able to do things that weaker bodies could not do, justifying different positions, activities, education, and power. This is about straight up making certain that a person's level of privilege based on sex, as well as social level by birth, could be determined immediately. And the reasons why people must be sorted immediately into male and female. The justification for sex as an organizing principle of society, those justifications have changed radically over the centuries in Western culture. The only thing that has stayed fairly constant is the insistence that men and women must be visibly separated and that those identified as male have greater value and should have greater power than those identified as female, at least within each social class. It would not do for a woman to pass herself off as a man and gain access to privileges to which she was not entitled by birth. But the reason for marking clothing clearly to indicate sex was not just that people could fake being a particular sex. It was because, as I suggested earlier in this lecture, in the early modern period, the body and sex were considered inherently unstable. The idea was not just that some individuals might pretend to deserve more privilege than the system allotted them, but that they might actually become completely someone who belonged to the more privileged group, in this case, male. Early modern ideas of sex and the body make absolutely no sense unless you have at least some idea of the understandings of human physical existence, largely taken from antiquity. Think Greek and Roman and modified through the Renaissance. The first of these concepts is humors, and we're not talking about jokes here. If you speak English, you may or may not be familiar with the concept of humors, but the idea that an excess of a particular humor, a lack of balance, affects personality is preserved in the English language. If someone feels melancholy or has a melancholic personality, they are generally sad and brooding. This is because they have an excess of black bile. Melan means black and call means bile. If someone had more phlegm, think snot or mucus, with respect to the other three humors, then they might be phlegmatic or unemotional and continuously calm. The word phlegm, phlegm, if you like, traces back to the Greek word for inflammation. So that's where that is coming from. Sanguine people have a greater proportion of blood. These people who tend to be optimistic and positive, regardless of how bad the situation might be. Sanguis was Latin for blood. Over much yellow bile could make someone choleric, peevish, irritable, easily annoyed. Call, as in melancholy, means bile. Call also shows up, so it's C-H-O-L, call, pronounced call, if you're listening. Call also shows up in the disease name cholera. The levels of humors in a person could change, and this would have effects on health and behavior. It was possible to have such an excess of one of the humors that the imbalance would result in disease. Hence, the practice of bleeding individuals with certain illnesses, a practice that generally seems counterintuitive to us today. Substances that induced vomiting or diarrhea were used to get rid of an excess of the other humors. Even when a body was reasonably balanced and in order, it was not a static, unchanging balance. The humors were fungible fluids, fungible meaning exchangeable or replaceable for something of like nature or kind. For example, blood could transform into semen in the correct circumstances. The second major concept of how bodies formed was the idea of heat. Heat was related to the humors. The amounts of heat here were not something that could be measured, like temperature, but heat was extremely important. Male bodies were male because there was so much heat that the genitals were extruded, ending up outside the body. We will come back to that. 
the heat produced in sexual intercourse was necessary for conception. And these pictures are of birthing. The idea that humors could shift when needed and the idea of heat, remember not actual temperature, bring us to the next relevant point. Before the Enlightenment, think the 1700s, both partners in sexual intercourse had to experience orgasm for conception to occur. Moreover, women were considered the body or lustful sex. And remember, we're talking about a world that's very different to our own. And we're talking about, we will be talking about how that change happened. Part of the reason at the time we're talking about that virgins and widows needed to marry was that they required a partner to channel their, meaning the woman's, lust. The book here is The School of Venus, published in 1680 and not just stocked in porn shops. And yes, the objects the women are checking out at the market table are exactly what they look like, what we might now refer to as the type of sex toys called dildos. This is a manual on sexuality and pleasure, women's sexuality and pleasure. In case you cannot read the frontispiece, the full thing says, the school of Venus or the lady's delight reduced into rules of practice. If you want to look at the entire book, you can find scans of some of the original printings in Google Books or through the UC Davis Library online. Most manuals with instructions to help a couple ensure orgasm for the woman were midwifery manuals, meaning that they covered everything related to reproduction, not just birth. Many had a section on conception and what to do if the couple appeared to be barren. This is Jane Sharp's midwifery manual. It is famous now among certain groups, and it was famous and a bestseller in the 1600s and not just for the section on conception. Sharp first published this midwifery guide in 1671, and as with the previous book, you can find scanned original copies through Google Books or the UC Davis Library. I know that you probably cannot see it in the slide here, but the first extract says that without delight in copulation on the part of the woman, conception could not occur. The second says that if copulation were not pleasurable for both partners, then no one of any sex would ever do what was required to reproduce. But this urge, and particularly the strong urge in women, would need to have an outlet, even if there were not a partner around to satisfy it. A 1662 directory for midwives by English physician Nicholas Culpepper defended not using a broken hymen and bleeding at first intercourse as meaning that the woman had already had sex with the man. In Culpepper's words, quoting, the hymen is not to be found in all virgins because some are very lustful and when it itcheth, and he's not talking about mosquito bite type itchiness here, they put in their finger or some other thing and break the membrane. In this case, they are not to be censured as unchaste. Not everyone agreed with that. The last concept that we need to understand is that for the early modern mind, the organization of the world and the cosmos was vertical, absolutely everything and everyone was ranked hierarchically. There was an ordained place for everything and everything should stay in its place because that place was decided by God. This is called variously the scala naturae, the ladder of being or the great chain of being. This was derived from antiquity but really developed under early and medieval Christianity. I know this is not obvious if you don't already know what you are looking at, but this is a chain extending down from God to the devil and hell. The closer to God, the higher the rank. So angels above humans, humans above birds, birds above fish, and so on. 
these characters on the right here, I've enlarged them a tiny bit over here, did not obey the rules. They stepped out of place in some way when they had a mortal body. As payback, their immortal souls are sent as far away from God as possible, in other words, to hell, where they will remain for eternity. In our historical context, it is very tempting to think that people understood all of these concepts, humors, heat, necessities for conception, and divine order as metaphors. And just like now, not everyone had identical ideas, but this was the baseline, what you lived and breathed from birth to death. So while there absolutely were discussions of what were and were not considered sins in the eyes of God and of the best way to end up close to God rather than damned to hell for all eternity, there was no question that there was an immortal soul or that it would be judged by God. If even a tiny bit of your brain has thought when I've said there is no reason except history and power for why men and women still are expected to be different in meaningful ways, that sex is still one of the categories at the heart of the organization of Western culture. If even the tiniest flicker of thought came to you, but male bodies are different from female bodies in ways that are surely important to society, men and women will inevitably end up occupying different places in society. If you had an inkling of the thought, that is your great chain of being talking. This hierarchical vertical structure is fundamental to the history of Western thought. Going into and through the early modern period, no one would have questioned these assumptions using the same logic and approach that we would use now to challenge them. Doesn't mean people didn't challenge them, but not the way we would now. The starting place was simply too fundamentally different, which makes it very hard for me to watch costume dramas in which the spunky heroine argues with others and behaves in a way that we would see as empowered now. It does not mean that there were no women who pushed back against power structures, but it absolutely does mean that they could only do so in terms that were legible to them in their own world, and those would not, for the most part, seem empowered or radical to 21st century minds. Back to sex and changing bodies. Western scholars from antiquity through the early modern period saw that the male form was a basic model of humanity and that the female form was analogous in every part, even if scholars argued about precisely which parts corresponded to which. Basically, females were males that did not develop perfectly. What Renaissance scholars saw and illustrated sometimes seems strange in light of intervening centuries of seeing two distinct sexes in the West, but it really is not unreasonable. The way that we see, the way we decide what differences count and how to interpret them are conditioned by assumptions and expectations. Neither of these sets of drawings is complete, one from 1543 and one from the late 1900s. Neither of them includes all of the goop and fibers that are really present in a human body. We have here Vesalius's 1543 representation of the reproductive anatomy of women on the left and men on the right. The drawings have been made from actual dissections of human bodies, but Vesalius, in his historical context, saw the female reproductive structures as clear analogs to the male, just retained inside the body. The vagina has the same basic form and function as the penis. It is just inside the body rather than outside. Stones are stones. 
male heat has simply caused the stones of men to drop or exit the core of the body. In case it seems too much like Vesalius cheated in his drawing and exaggerated the similarities, the other image here is by Frank Netter and is from one of the anatomy atlases we were expected to get when I took gross anatomy from the Indiana University Medical School. In past classes, students have brought up the pink, blue, female, male associations. I find it interesting that Netter has rendered the male reproductive system in pink and the female in blue, except for the stones that are blue in both. In case you have not deduced it yet, stones was used for both ovaries and testes. Since they were stones, regardless, both members of a copulating couple who hoped to have a child needed to reach climax in order to release seed. Their members, clitoris and yard, were just a bit different in size and location, but the same in terms of function. The way that Renaissance scholars saw what they saw was not so entirely odd as we might now think, especially given the assumptions that they had starting in. But if these structures were essentially the same, except for location, internal or external, what is to stop this from changing into this as a result of activity, say? In the Renaissance and early modern system of understanding sex, cases like Thomas Thomasine Hall made sense. This drawing is not Thomas Thomasine, but someone in France, the one on the left here. The heat of the individual, this is the making sense part, the heat of the individual had been enough to start the process of extruding genitals to form a male, but not enough to complete the process. In other words, what we would call intersex now. Perfectly logical. No problem, right? No, big problem. In fact, compared to their counterparts in European countries like France, Thomas Thomasine was treated rather leniently. They emerged with body and soul intact and still connected. Europeans generally exterminated, killed individuals who were likely to upset power structures. In early modern English thought, a monster was anything out of the ordinary, and women did give birth to babies that were out of the ordinary, although probably not cats, rabbits, nor half dogs, nor half birds. Generally, an out of the ordinary infant, and often the mother as well, died close to the birth. But if the monster did not die at birth, it could be helped along a bit. In the 21st century U.S., in cases of seriously out of the ordinary babies, the baby is examined by a doctor sorted and diagnosed with a named condition, for example, anencephalus babies. Neonatal anencephaly is a condition in which the head does not form correctly and which has been caused by some interruption or error in fetal development. But in the 16th and 17th centuries, such babies were quite literally, in the parlance or the language of the time, monsters. And the cause of a monstrous baby needed to be determined. Such a baby could be an omen, in which case you'd better try to avert the bad thing you've been warned about, whatever it might be, or prep your immortal soul for the bad thing to happen. A monstrous baby could be the result of witchcraft in which case you needed to identify the witch and prep her immortal soul. Or it could be that the mother had sex with the devil and the appropriate souls and bodies needed to be dealt with in some way. A quick word here, because women were the more sexually avid sex, and because the devil was apparently quite skilled in the performance of sexual intercourse, and finally, because some sort of baby was created, the woman must have achieved orgasm. It was clear that the woman had solicited the devil, not the other way around, as movies and books tend to present it now. 
Whether you were the bearer of an unlucky omen, warning of an event that needed to be averted, or the victim of a witch, in which case the mother was not responsible, or a woman who had got nasty with the devil and needed to be purged from the community, the assessment there had a great deal to do with the status of your family, and if you were a single woman with no remaining living relatives. The early modern English folks arriving in the New World, as they thought of it, genuinely believed in the great chain of being, monsters, witchcraft, and damnation. I am going to insert an important point here. I know that the print on this slide is small. I will include these points in your key points for this lecture. So if you cannot read the slide, listen to what I'm saying. We do not look at historical context to give historical actors a pass for harming others. We know from documents that people often knew when their actions would hurt others, and they proceeded despite knowing. For example, executing a witch was a choice that judges debated in each and every case. The option of finding a woman innocent or of not accusing her in the first place was always on the table, no matter how much someone believed in witchcraft and the fires of hell. Most of the people who knowingly made decisions to harm others, particularly from a position of power, leveraged a system of belief to get what they wanted directly or indirectly to one degree or another. I have yet to see any belief system that does not have an option at all for refraining from hurting people. Historians need to examine the historical context that explains the motivation and methods of any historical actor. But historians do not need to refrain from casting personal moral judgment on that historical actor and or their choices. We just have to minimize and or acknowledge the ways in which it influences our analysis. Historians and scholars in most fields argue about whether complete objectivity is possible. I am in the school of thought that there is no such thing as complete objectivity, which is why we need to examine our biases, and future historians need to examine our historical context for those biases that we are never going to see ourselves. I am also not convinced that even if complete and total objectivity could be achieved, it would be a good thing in every case, but that becomes a philosophical discussion. The early modern English colonists, unlike the French or the Spanish, did not intermarry with Native Americans except in relatively rare instances. This does not mean that sex never happened between English colonists and Native Americans, but that it happened far, far less frequently in English colonies than in Spanish or French ones. Part of this had to do with zealous Protestant reformers like the Puritans. We will get to examining them more closely in the next module. But much of the reason that English Native American liaisons were relatively uncommon has to do with the anxieties that the English had about their place in the world. The English, like many people, thought they were inherently better than everyone else, including their European neighbors. But they worried constantly that this superiority might slip away. On the one hand, the English, like many other Europeans in the early modern period, used sexual metaphors to describe the relationship between England and the Americas. For example, America was described as a virgin wilderness waiting to be penetrated by English explorers and colonists. Here, the male power of England would plant itself in fertile but untouched New World, personified as female. On the other hand, the English in the early modern period worried that their bodies and souls could be changed for the worse by contact with uncivilized savage surroundings. We've 
already seen that the one sex model of the early modern period meant that bodies might potentially morph between genders. You are also reading for this lecture about the commitment of English colonists to identifying and marking gender on every person. English colonists also worried that the unstable body could morph into savagery in the wrong climate. Colonists believed that Native Americans could be civilized by contact with the English, but that made them worry that the English might lose their supposedly innate virtue and civility through contact with other peoples. Of all interactions, sexual contact was the most dangerous in this regard to the early modern Englishman. You are looking at the woman whose name is often rendered now as as Pocahontas. She did marry an Englishman early in the arc of English colonization. The Englishman took her to England, and as you see here, she was dressed as an Englishwoman. Identifying her and labeling her with clothing and name meant that Pocahontas had been made as English as possible and was far less likely to be a danger to those around her, including her English husband by basically infecting them with savagery. You might note also that the English often referred to Pocahontas as a princess, which was not really a translatable category. But the fact that she was high class combined with reclothing her as an English woman minimized the chance of pollution, in quotes. I believe that this painting of Pocahontas is the only one made during her lifetime. After the key points in the coda, we will look at a few representations of Pocahontas, or rather of ideas of Pocahontas. Key points for Lecture 8. For early modern, think 1600s, Europeans, the observation that bodies could and often did change in major ways, like being alive to being dead was a matter of concern. Included in the ways that bodies could potentially change were transformations between male and female. The categories constructed at the root of European worldview, particularly English, were sex and hereditary class. Any disruption of these, any proof that these could change, could disrupt life, civilization, and the cosmos. The foundational logic behind the structure of European society was the great chain of being. Absolutely everyone and everything had a place ordained by God that they, or it, for things like rocks, occupied in a hierarchy between heaven and hell. If an individual tried to change their place in the hierarchy, they were questioning a decision of God. The body might be mortal and corruptible, but the soul was immortal. A person as a human would start out fairly high in the hierarchy, but going against God's will could cause a soul to be banished from the sight of God into the fires of hell for all eternity. Humans included four humors, and the relative levels of these could fluctuate, affecting an individual's personality, like melancholy, or health, as in the case in disease. Associated with the humors was the concept of heat, remember, not a measurable temperature. Male and female bodies were made of the same building blocks. The only difference was that the greater heat of a male caused the genitals to be extruded rather than maintained inside the body as they were for women. The male body was defined as superior. The woman's body represented a failure to attain perfection, but it was still useful because conception required enough heat to transform some of the humors into seed, both the male and female were expected to enjoy sex. Conception could not happen if both partners in intercourse did not experience orgasm. Women at the time were assumed to have a much greater sexual appetite than men. 
anything out of the ordinary was a monster. Monstrous births could be omens, or they could be the result of the spells of a witch or from sexual intercourse with the devil. The English assumed that they were naturally just below the angels on the great chain of being, but because bodies could be changed by outside factors, the English worried that if they left England for the so-called New World as individuals, they might become more savage and slip down the great chain of being. The English feared sexual intercourse with Native Americans could corrupt the English person and cause them to slip down the great chain of being. The wrong climate might have the same effect, but the English desperately wanted land, and North America had that. As a group, English colonists avoided sexual intercourse with Native Americans in order to maintain their own superior status. And I didn't put it on the slide, but I'll add now for you to think about one of the ways that this manifested. We talked about Métis children, Métisage, in the last lecture with the French. There was a category like that in colonial Spanish society. The English had no place, no place even considered lower for the children of Native Americans and whites, Europeans, Englishmen. On this first slide of the coda, you are looking at three images of Pocahontas created at three different times. The one on the far left you have seen before. It is the only representation made during her life. Despite her physical presence when it was made, the painted image has far more to do with how the English constructed Native Americans than it does the actual woman, whose name was probably something closer to Matoaka. I could not find a date for the image in the middle, but judging from the aesthetic and imagery, I would guess between the late 19th century and the end of the first third of the 20th century. This one on the right is fairly recent. You can see that it is made under the auspices of Disney. You will, of course, dutifully consider what each of these images says about white stereotypes of Native Americans, and especially Native American women, at different points in time as clearly none of them represent the actual living, breathing woman who existed in the early 17th century. It's also worth thinking about the fact that all of these images focus on women. Some of Mataoka's male relatives went to England with her. Their names and images have not become legend, and they certainly have not served to encapsulate centuries of hegemonic white, Anglophone, or English-speaking anxieties and fantasies about their relationship to North America.